All right, good morning, everyone. Um, it's great to be here. It's great to see everyone. Um, wasn't planning on preaching today last night. My lovely wife and I, we were at the football game, watching our team, of course, crush the other team. Um, and uh, we had a great time, but it's great to be here and be able to preach this morning. I'm going to continue this morning on my message of being a strong believer and the example of David out of 1 Samuel 17. So if you guys would turn your Bibles with me to 1 Samuel chapter 17. And I just want to do a little bit of a recap this morning before we continue on. <clears throat> and seeing the example of how we can compare David's faith and David's strength as a, his trust and his belief and his faith in God of how we as believers can use that as an example of um, his trust of what he had. And uh, just to recap a few things here about David, we know the story here in 1 Samuel 17 is obviously the story of David and Goliath. Um, David going up against the giant, the story, and probably one of the most well-loved and well-known stories in the Bible is the story of David and Goliath. If you go to someone that doesn't even know anything about the Bible and you mention David and Goliath, they usually know exactly what you're talking about. And they always say, yeah, it's about the boy who killed the giant. And um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot more details, though, I think, here than just dealing with David killing the giant. It's dealing with his faith that he has here in God. And we talked about how this giant here in verse, if you look with me in verse 8 and verse uh, through 10, it says here, And he stood, cried unto the armies of Israel, and said unto them, this is Goliath speaking here, he says, And said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine, and you servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will be your servants, but if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall he be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a what? So he's not asking for a youth. He's not asking for a boy here. And we see here that David's brothers and others refer to David here as a youth. If you go with me to verse 33, it says, And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a what? And he, a man of war from his youth. So he's saying that, David, you don't have experience to go against a guy of this stature. You don't have experience to go against a guy who has always been involved in fighting wars and fighting battles. You don't have the experience. You are but a youth. And if you go with me to verse 42... 1 Samuel uh, 17, verse 42, it says, And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a what? And ruddy in a fair countenance. So what that's saying is he recognized him, he looked at him and said, This is not a man of war. This isn't a guy that's going to be able to fight against me. I asked for a man, and then you guys are going to send out to me a youth. And so Goliath, in his mind at this point, thinks he's got an easy victory over Israel. And um, we talked about how God today, not, not only back, we see Goliath there talking about a man, but God also refers to and wants the same thing today from us as he wants mature, grounded believers. If you go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, because shortly here the, Phil the Philistine is going to find out that David isn't just but a youth, but he's a man of God. And in uh, 1 Corinthians 16, Paul just, this, this, he's coming to a close here, and this, this book is very, um, very large epistle that Paul wrote here. And in 1 Corinthians 16, he ends it here in verse 13. He says, Watch ye, stand fast in the what? Quit you like men, be what? So what does God want from us as believers? Well, it says here he wants us to watch, he wants us to stand fast in the faith, and he wants us to quit us like men and be what? And we looked at and we'll possibly, we're probably going to go look at it again, that where we get and draw our strength from is being strong in the Lord and in the power of his what? And that's where we as believers begin to draw our strength. <clears throat> and so we looked at those things there and how every believer has the ability to be a strong believer. And we looked at it how sometimes people think that they can't be a strong believer and they can't have strong faith. But the reality is, is that when you have God's word and you take God's word in, 
Guess what? It says that we can stand fast in the faith, that God's word will work in us, that God will give us the strength, and that his grace is sufficient. And so we looked at some of those things. And our first point we looked at last week was is that David, the reason why he had, was able to have, be a strong believer and have faith is, is because David loved God more than he feared Goliath. And a lot of times believers allow their fear to control them rather than allowing the love of God to constrain us, like Paul mentions in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And so we looked at that. If you go with me to 1 Samuel 17, and we're not going to go through all the verses again. We don't have time to obviously do that. But in 1 Samuel 17, we're going to see here of what the nation of Israel was the opposite of what God had told him. God, when he told Joshua, he said, Be thou strong and very courageous. Go into the land that I give you. When people come up against thee, I'm going to give you the strength. You are going to be able to go through your enemies. But at this point, we come to 1 Samuel 17, and they're afraid. They're not standing strong. If you look at me with me at verse 11, so the Philistine just defied. He said in verse 10, And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Israel should have instantly had a man and sent him out. But what does it say that they did here? It says, when Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were what? Dismayed and greatly afraid. Now, should that have been their reaction to the Philistine? No, but it was. Verse 24, it also says, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, ran and attacked him. No, what did they do? It says, fled from him and were sore afraid. So that is the opposite of what they should have been. They should have been strong in the Lord, knowing that God had already given them the victory. And we're going to see David was able to stand fast in the fact that he knew he already had the victory before he went out there because he had his faith in God. And we talked about, obviously, how God isn't going to physically do things like that for us today. But God gives us strength in our inner man to be able to deal with the spiritual warfare that we're facing. And when David heard them, David was angered. He had a different reaction than what the nation of Israel. In 1 Samuel 17, and verse 25, it says, And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel has he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches, and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. So Saul even tried to bribe their flesh to go out and fight this guy. I'm going to give you riches. I'm going to give you my own daughter. I'm going to make you a part with me. And guess what? There still wasn't a man that stepped up. Verse 26, and it says, And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living who? Now, all of Israel, imagine all of the army there. King Saul sitting there, his greatest warriors around with him, sore afraid, and this shepherd boy comes to bring his brother's food, and then he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that defies the armies of God? And he's going to tell him, I will go and fight this Philistine. Why did he do it? Because he loved God more than he feared Goliath. Do you think there was a little bit of fear when he stood there and saw that man? Yeah. Do we as believers become fearful sometimes? Yes. But we learned and we know that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of what? But of power and of love and of a sound mind. So when we're fearful, we know that that's our flesh. That's not God. If we fear people more than we love God, we are not going to be strong in the Lord. And that's why we need to be strong in his might and in his strength. And we looked at the example of Paul of how he loved God more than he feared the people because in Acts chapter 14, we're not going to go back and look at that. Let's just go look at that. Okay, so we're not going to. Let's just go look at that briefly. Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14, and starting in 19. It says, And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium, who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. 
Imagine being stoned and then drug out of a city and left for dead. Then it says, How be it as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derb. And when they had preached the what? So he just went from being stoned to doing what? Preaching the gospel. What did he says? And had preached the gospel to the city and had taught many. They returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch. So they're going around and still preaching the word. They had just been stoned. So do you, do you think the love of Christ was constraining Paul to go out and preach? Absolutely. Do you think he was allowing his fear of being stoned again to control him? No, he was allowing God's word to work in him. And he wasn't afraid. The answer to fear, one of the things is love. Because it says, And God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of what? and of love and of a strong mind or sound mind and we understand that as God's word begins to get in us it begins to work in us it begins to constrain us and then we get on with the work of sharing the gospel and preaching the gospel the second thing that David did that we can learn something from is, is that David did not allow criticism to discourage him now, a big thing I think a lot of people I think we all are a little bit fearful of is criticism and when people begin to criticize us a lot of times we allow it to discourage us. And David did not allow that to happen to him. If you go back with me to 1 Samuel 17. First Samuel 17. And by the way, any time that there's criticism around, a lot of times it may be because we are standing fast in our faith. And being strong. It says that all that will live godly shall suffer persecution in who? In Christ Jesus. <clears throat> First Samuel chapter 17 and verse 28. So David just answered him and asked about who kills him. Who's this uncircumcised Philistine that defies God's armies? And in verse 28 it says, And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men. And Eliab's what? It was kindled against David, and he said, Why camest thou down hither, and with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and thy naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the what? So does that sound like words of building his brother up? No, he's trying to discourage him. You know, there's another brother in the Bible that, who, who was angered against his brother and ended up killing him? Who was that? Cain. Right? And so his brother here is angered with him. And partially it's probably because he knows he should have been strong. But he was fearful. He was upset that his brother was not fearful. But David did not allow that criticism to discourage him. King Saul himself tries to discourage him as well. In 1 Samuel 17, verse 31, it says, And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. So it doesn't sound like Saul's trying to build him up to get ready to go and fight. But did David allow that to discourage him from going and fighting? No. He stood fast. He stood strong. And people will say to us sometimes as believers, it can't be done, you can't go out and do that. When people are criticizing and against us. You know who we need to be strong in? We need to be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. By the way, this is just recap. That's why I'm going a little fast. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. Paul's finishing, he's writing, finishing, giving his final words here. And he says in verse 10, he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the who? And in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of who? Why? It says that he may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Verse 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, 
that he may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to what? It's a lot different than what armored David was going to be given. It's a lot different than what David was going to be doing. David was going to fight a physical battle. We just learned from these verses here, we're not going out to fight a physical battle. There's a lot of times people in churches will take the story of David and say that we are going to go out and fight these physical battles and physical things. But the reality is, is for us as believers, we understand our battle is a spiritual battle. Obviously, physical criticism may come from that, but it's because of what we're fighting spiritually, not physically. Go with me to chapter 3, Ephesians 3. And verse 17 says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that he being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that he might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him, who is that? God, right? It says, now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that what? So according to that verse, we have a power that works in us. And whose power is that? That's God's power that works in us. That's Christ's power that works in us. That is his word that we start to put in, that we begin to meditate on, that we give ourselves to it, and it starts to begin to work out through us as believers. Philippians chapter 4, a verse that's a lot of times taken and not used properly, but a verse that means, can mean so much if we understand the context of it. Philippians 4 verse 13, so many people know this verse, so many people say it's their favorite verse, but then when you ask them about the verse, they don't really know anything about it. To know what Philippians 4.13 says, we have to look at what comes before it. And it says in verse 11, he says, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have what? In whatsoever state I am there, wit to be content. I, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Then he says in verse 13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth who? Can Christ, can we do all things through Christ which strengthens us? Yes, whether we're suffering or whether we're abounding, whether we're full, whether we're hungry, when we understand our identity in Christ and become content in our identity in Christ, that's what it's talking about when it says, I can do all things through Christ. Because I can understand my identity and be content with where I'm at. And today we talked about already that we are not facing a literal physical battle because we're facing a present evil world facing our flesh, we're facing the powers of darkness, and we can have an understanding that we can be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. The point I left off last time is in um, David recognized that there was a cause worth fighting for, and we kind of started getting into this and talking about this, that he understood what the cause and what he was fighting for. When David heard Goliath, he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? He was ready to fight. He is defying the armies of God. He wasn't going out to fight for himself and his own pride. He was going out to fight because this uncircumcised Philistine is defying the armies of the living God. He is defying the nation of which God has promised that his blessings would come through. And if you go back with me to 1 Samuel 17, 1 Samuel 17, and verse 28, 1 Samuel 17, and verse 28. It said, And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride. That's a pretty big accusation against someone, saying, I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, I love what he says here. He says, What have I now done? Is there not a what? So a cause is, is he knows there's a reason to go out and fight. And his answer to him, is there not a cause? 
Verse 30, it says, And he turned from him towards another and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. In verse 31, it says, And when David, and when the words which were heard which David spake, they returned and rehearsed them. And he sent for him. And Saul sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight. Why? Because he knows the cause. He knows that God has given them the ability to go out and already win this battle. Verse, <clears throat> go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Let's look at something here. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It's kind of hard to go and fight against someone if you don't know what you're fighting for. And Paul uses a few different examples here. We're going to see in 1 Corinthians and also here in 2 Corinthians of knowing what, our, what we are going out and doing. And Satan's goal is, is to obviously, if you're going to go out and fight, if you're going to go out and run a race, if you blind someone, how are they going to do? They're not going to be able to do it, right? And so Satan's goal is to blind people from the gospel of Christ. And we see here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting in verse 1, it says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of who? Verse 3 says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them, which what? Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine what? So what is the goal there? Our goal is, is to not handle the word of God deceitfully. Our goal is, is to make sure the glorious gospel of Christ is displayed, holding forth the word of life. What is Satan? We learned something here in whom the God of this world hath what? Blinded the minds. So Satan's goal is to blind them. Our goal is what? To share the light of the glorious gospel. Sounds like two different things, doesn't it? Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Remember, David said, he says, is there not a cause? In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, in verse 22, Paul writes, he says, to the weak became I as weak that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men that by all means save what? When we preach the gospel, we can't get discouraged by the fact that that 90%, 99%, whatever percent, most people are going to reject the gospel. But the goal is, what does he say there? That by all means save some. There is going to be some. And this I do, verse 23, for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you, knowing not that they which run in a race run how? They're going to give it their all. But one receiveth the prize, so run that he may obtain... Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we, and what? Then verse 26, he says, I therefore so run, not as what? What does that mean? He knows what he's running for. He says, so fight I, not as one that beateth the what? He knows what he's running for. He knows what he's fighting against. Do we know that? Yes, we do, because of God's word, understanding what Paul is talking about here. We run a race that we know. He says in Philippians, he says, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He knows what fight he's a part of. He knows he's a part of a spiritual battle and a spiritual warfare here. And Paul is basically saying in these verses, there is a cause and I am fully committed to it. And each and every single one of us here should be committed to it as well and know our cause. David knew his cause physically going up against Goliath. We know our cause of going up spiritually against in our spiritual warfare. And Paul constantly encouraged Timothy to be a part of that and be committed to the fight. If you go with me to 1 Timothy. Paul refers obviously to Timothy here as being a son to him in the faith. 
He was right there with Paul when Paul was going on with the work and doing his journeys. Paul would send Timothy out when he couldn't go to places to make sure things were placed and put in order. Paul is going to, and we're going to see in 2 Timothy, commit to him and say, listen, I'm done. My section of the course is over. It's your turn to get on with the work, Timothy, and continue on. And in 1 Timothy chapter 1, in verse 18, he says, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a what? He needs to know, he needs to know what the fight is. Does Timothy know what it is? Yes, he does. Is Timothy a part of that? Yes, he does. And you see in the point of 2 Timothy, the Timothy's getting a little bit worn out. And Paul's going to say it's time to get strong and get built back up. If you go with me to chapter 6 here, 1 Timothy 6. Actually, let's stop in chapter 4 here. I just saw it when I was flipping through. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 12. Timothy was a young man, and Paul's going to encourage him here. He says in verse 12, he says, Let no man, what? But then he's going to tell him some things here. He says, But be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. It sounds like a lot of things he needs to be strong in. Then he says, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to what? What's going to keep him on the track of being an example? Doing what he just told him. Give attendance to reading, to exhortation, and to what? To the doctrine. Verse 15 says, Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself, and what? Unto the doctrine. If he doesn't take heed unto the doctrine, guess what? He's going to get off track. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that what? That is what Timothy needs to be committed to. And he's reminding him, that is not only what Timothy needs to be committed to, that is what we need to be committed to. Chapter 6, go with me to chapter 6. <clears throat> and I kind of rushed through these last time. That's why I want to go back through them. And uh, Paul lists a bunch of things here of being proud, perverse disputings of men, not being content. Having the love of, verse 10 says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after it, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many what? That doesn't sound like a joyful man, does it? Then he says, But thou, O man of God, what does he say? Flee these things. So is there a time to stand and fight? Yes. Is there a time that we should be fleeing? Yes, because he says, Flee these things and follow. Now he's going to give him something to do. And follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Verse 12 says, fight the good fight of what? Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of who? He is committed. He has charged Timothy. What does he need to be doing? Warring a good warfare. Fighting the good fight. Laying hold on eternal life grasping it. Go with me to 2 Timothy. In chapter 1, it's not on the board, but let's go to chapter 1 just briefly. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3 says, I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee being mindful of thy what? That I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee what? Paul's saying he's remembering him in prayer. He's thinking about him. He knows he's a little bit maybe tired, maybe a little bit discouraged. But he says bringing to remembrance, he brings into remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in him. It's genuine, it's true, it's strong. He says, Wherefore I put thee, in verse 6, in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of what? Why does he have to remind him of that? Because there's times that we are going to be fearful. 
He says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his what? Sometimes maybe we share the gospel, but sometimes maybe we're ashamed to share about what Paul has to say. He says, Be not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the what? That is what we need to be a part of. Go with me to chapter 2. Chapter 2, in verse 3, it says, Thou therefore endure what? As a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Who are soldiers of Jesus Christ? Every single believer. And what do we need to do? It says, Thou therefore endure what? David, as he's getting ready to go and face the giant there, is he getting ready to have to endure hardness? He's already facing it. He's getting criticized by his own brother. He's getting criticized by the own king. And you know what he's going to do? He endures it, he goes through it, and he's going to go out and do what he knew God already had won for him. He did not allow the criticism to discourage him. We should not allow that because we know we are going to have to face hardness. Verse 4 says, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who had chosen him to be a what? Where does our focus need to be on? It needs to be on Christ. That's what gets us through it. If you go with me to chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 5 says, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. In verse 6, he says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. So he said, By the way, Timothy, writing these words of encouragement, but my time's over. Then he tells him here, he says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have what? I have kept the faith. He's saying that he participated in the good fight. He ran his section of the race, and that he protected and guarded the faith and held on to it. Now it's your turn, Timothy, to keep on with the work. Be strong in the Lord. Continue with the good fight. Run the race that is set before us and keep the faith. And Paul knows what's laid up. He says, henceforth there is laid up for me, what? Crown of righteousness. He knows what's waiting for him. What a strong faith Paul had, facing, getting ready to go through and face that. Strong believers recognize that there is a cause and are faithful to the fight even if it means sometimes personal sacrifice. And it isn't always going to be, well, Paul was always beat down. It doesn't mean that that's going to happen to us. It can be what people say about us. It can be maybe sometimes I'm not going to get a certain job. I'm not going to have certain people that I really like. They're not going to like me now because of what I stand for in my faith. We need to stand fast in God's word. Go with me to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Paul writes something here and we got to see the end result of it. Acts chapter 20 and verse 24. Uh, let's go back to verse... Let's go back to verse 22. He says, And now behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me, but none of these things, what? Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with what? What did Paul get to say at the end to second, in 2 second Timothy? I have finished my course. What does he want to do? He says, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Did Paul get to do that? Yes, he did. Our prayer should be that we finish our courses with joy to be able to say what he said. Our, our, we're not going to obviously be able to do what Paul did and maybe what Timothy did and what Epaphroditus and some of these other guys did. We all have our courses set. Whether we have families, husbands, wives, single, whatever we're doing, wherever we're at, whatever season we're at, can we have a course and finish it with joy? Yes. 
But we have to stay on track. We have to set our affection on things above. Is there not a cause to be preaching the gospel? Yes, there is. Just as David knew his cause, we need to know ours. And a lot of believers play church. But we are in a battle for the souls of lost people. And I think sometimes I find in myself even taking my eyes off of the fact that when I'm walking around and seeing people, are they saved? Are they going to be spending eternity with God? Or are they going to be spending eternity separated from God in torment for eternity? And it's our job to share the gospel, the grace of God, to finish our courses with joy, to fight the good fight. The last thing I want to talk about is David knew where victory was to be found. Today, we know where the victory has already been found. We know we already have the victory in Christ. But David already knew. If you go with me to, back to 1 Samuel chapter 17. And it's been really fun studying through the book of 1 Samuel. Just going through and seeing these stories here and the faith of David and the strength of David. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Verse 33, let's start there because David's going to talk to Saul about some of the things that he has accomplished, that he's not just a simple shepherd boy. He says here in verse 33, he says, And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, You're right, I'm going to go home. No, he says, And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and what did he do? And smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him. And what? Wow! How many of us would be willing to stand against a lion and a bear? Maybe with a nice high-powered rifle. He says, Thy servant, verse 36, slew both the lion and the bear, and I love what he's getting ready to say here. He says, And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as what? Does he sound afraid? Oh, no. He says, This uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them. Why does he say this? He says, Seeing he hath defied the armies of the who? Did David sound confident that he was going to be able to go out there and win the battle? Yes, he did. Then verse 37, it says, And David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. So Saul must be seeing something a little bit different here. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not what? He doesn't know, he hasn't ever used this. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off. David had no experience with it. He doesn't know. He's never worn this armor. He's never fought with this armor. He says, I haven't proved them. And he also knows that Saul is not going to hand him this battle, that God is going to hand him this battle. And uh, when he tries it on, he says, thanks, but no thanks. I don't need this. He says in verse 40, And he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook. Why five? That's an interesting. All of his brothers, right? And he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag which he had, even in a scrip. And his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. And what's going to happen here, we're going to see the Philistines insulted. It says in verse 41, And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. Verse 42, And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he what? He disdained him. For he was but a youth and ruddy and a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, I like what he says here, Am I a what? Yes, he is. <laughs> Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? Which you learn that, yes, he is a dog, and that's why David's coming out to fight him. He says, uh, verse, he says, And the Philistine cursed David by his what? 
See what this battle is really over? Satan's policy of evil was functioning back then. How did Goliath curse him? By his gods. Who was the Philistine armies fighting for? For their gods. Little, who was the one behind the scenes though? It was Satan, of course. And then it says in verse 44, and, Dave, and the Philistines said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Does Goliath sound pretty confident here? Oh yeah, he's very, very confident. Verse 45, Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of my own pride. No, he says, And I come to thee in the name of who? Isn't that an amazing answer? He's not defying him. He's saying, I'm telling you who I'm coming in the name of. I come unto thee in the name of the Lord of hosts and the, the God of the armies of Israel whom thou hast what? Verse 47, it says, And all the assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with the sword and spear. See why he gave it back to David or gave it back to Saul? He says, And all the assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear for the battle is the who? And he will give you into our hands. I love that response there. He tells him, you're going down. The Lord has already given me this battle. But where did David's source of confidence come from? It came from the Lord. It wasn't going to come through sword and spear. Then it says in verse 48 here, he says, And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran how? You see that? He didn't back down. He sees the Philistine coming. What's he do? He goes and he runs at him. Which is an excellent strategy, by the way, considering he's a lot smaller. It says, And he arose and drew and meet David, and David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the what? Now imagine seeing that battle, this giant man that's nine feet tall, proportion. This guy who's probably an average looking guy runs towards him, pulls out his sling and his stone and hits him right in the forehead and boom, down goes Goliath. Do you think there was, whoa, Oz in the crowd that time? Oh yeah, and then it continues on though. It says in David, uh, verse 50, so David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. So what's David going to do here? Verse 51, it says, therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine. Imagine this, all taking place. And took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, what did they do? They were no longer ready to fight anymore. And David comes out, someone they had never seen, a man not experienced, a man they considered a youth. And what does he come out and do? Slew the Philistine and told him what he was going to do before he did it and said, the Lord has already delivered you into our hands. And then what happens? He already knew the victory was there. He just went out and claimed it and grabbed it. In the faith he had to do that. The whole nation, the whole army of Israel stood by for 40 days, allowing that Philistine to do that. David comes out there and then does what God intended for him to already have done because God has already delivered him into our hand. We are not fighting a physical battle like that. And I love reading stories like that of the faith they had to do that. Do you think Satan desires to discourage believers today? Absolutely. We don't face those physical giants, but we know we're in a spiritual battle and warfare. Where is the source? Let me ask, where is the source of our victory? In Christ. Go with me to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Chapter called by many the, the resurrection chapter because it talks about the importance of the resurrection. It gives the gospel that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day. And by just simply placing our faith in that, that's what saves us. He talks about people that are starting to say that the, 
there wasn't a resurrection. And Paul's going to say, if there's no resurrection, what we do is all in vain and it's meaningless. Then he's going to say, he's going to give us some new information that one day in a twinkling of an eye, this corruptible will put on incorruption. He says in verse 55, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 55, he says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy what? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. Guess where both of those were nailed? To the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, but thanks be to God, which what? So who has the victory? We do. Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the who. So we go out and labor. We go out and do these things. Why? Because we have already been handed and given the victory. God makes it real easy for us. We don't have to ponder and wonder, am I going to go out and win? Do I need to live my life in fear? Guess what? God has already given us the victory. He has already given us the strength. Go with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Oh, I guess my time's almost up. Romans chapter 8. I'm almost done. Romans chapter 8, and we'll start in verse 35. He says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? It's a good question, isn't it? Is there something that can separate us? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or sword or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Does he end there though? No, he says, nay, in all these things we are more than what? What does a conqueror do? He has victory. He wins. He says, Nay, and all this, we are more than conquerors through who? Him that loved us. For I am persuaded, that means he fully knows, that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in who? Who has the victory? We do. Who has the love of God? We do. Who has the strength of God? We do. Our victory is in the Lord Jesus Christ because He is our victory. He is our strength. He is where we learn our love. He is where we get our joy from. And as we yield to Him, we need to just simply rest in that victory because we have it. We need to have that confidence, know what cause we're fighting for, we need to love God more than we fear people and what they can do. We need to not allow criticism to discourage us to be strengthened by God's word. We need to recognize that there is a cause worth fighting for. The cause is, is the souls of lost men and women that they need to hear the gospel, the, glory, the glorious gospel of Christ and that we as believers need to rely totally on Christ for the victory. Now we understand we're doing, we have different things that we're doing today compared to what the nation of Israel and God's intended plan for the earth is. But can we learn something from what David did? I think so. I know I did. And we can be strong in the fact of knowing that. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Let's just give thanks. Father, thank you for us being able to come here and look at the story of David together and see where David drew his strength from. Thank you, God, for being able to give us your perfect word to be able to go and see these things and study these things and see how you worked back then with the nation of Israel and compare it to how you work today. May we go out and rely totally on the victory that you've already given us. And in Christ's name, amen.